this month on America Reframed. Chinese people in Mississippi? What happened there? I like theater, and my mom can't do anything about it. That's what being in a democracy means, that there are values that we share in common that we can respect each other. That's when you smile to yourself and think, this is my city. It's pure Hamtramck, and there's no place like it. Watch Tuesdays on World Channel or online at worldchannel.org. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us on our very special filmmaker panel on our upcoming films, sharing the Asian American Pacific Islander experience. My name is Larissa Lam, and I'm one of those filmmakers. I'm the director and producer of Far East Steep South, and I'll be guiding us through today's program. Now we've got a full house of amazing filmmakers to share their stories today, and we really encourage you to use the Q&A to send us your questions during the live session. Now, today we're going to be talking with this amazing group, and these include Far East Deep South, which I know a little bit something about, and we'll be talking with producer and the family subject, Baldwin Chu. Uh, we will also be talking with Curtain Up, the team Hui Tong and Kelly Ng, and we'll also be talking with Yi Chen from First Vote as well as the team from Hamtramck USA, Justin Feltman and Razi Joffrey. And at the end, we will have a Q&A section, section for all the filmmakers. So once again, don't forget, you can put your questions in the Q&A button, and we really hope to hear from you. Now, you can watch all these films and more AAPI stories on air and streaming on World Channel and you can watch them on air TV. Yes, if you still watch your TV. And of course you can stream them on the PBS app as well. Now we got some housekeeping we wanna go over with before we get started. I wanna explain how this works. Some of you may be familiar with Zoom. Some of you may or may not have been on a Zoom webinar before. So wanna let you know that you won't see yourself on video and you will not be able to speak during the event, but that's okay because we still wanna hear from you. So you can ask your questions in the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen and you just tap it in your question. So there's a bar at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, tap that. And if you see a question that you also want to hear the answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up and move it up to the top of the list. And we will do our best to ask the most popular questions. We have a couple, couple of films dealing with elections, so it's only fitting that you get to vote for your questions as well. Zoom has recently rolled out an auto captioning feature that we want to make sure that you're aware of so participants can enjoy today's events. We know not all of you may see the, the button, so we apologize if it's not visible for everyone. But if you want to activate the closed captioning feature, try to look for the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And there's a two transcription display options to pop up. We recommend that you select the subtitle to enable the closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. Now you can also select full scram transcript and a sidebar window will pop up where you can actually see what the speaker is saying. So bear in mind the closed captioning might still be delayed and there might be some typos. So please forgive us for that. Okay, are you guys ready to get started? Well, I'm gonna introduce this first film, which uh, basically happened because I got dragged on a trip to Mississippi about six years ago. So here is the trailer for Far East Deep South. Growing up, it was always kind of a mystery about my dad and his side of the family. Whenever my brother and I would ask him about my grandfather, he would just say, oh, it's a sad story. It's, it's not a big deal. One day we came across this photo of a gravestone, and that's when my dad finally told us that this is where my grandfather and great-grandfather were buried, but not in China, in Mississippi. Chinese people in Mississippi? What happened there? I actually don't know where we are going and where we're going. Last thing I thought I'd ever find in Mississippi was a Chinese museum. I guess there was more than just my grandfather and my great-grandfather. When the Chinese first came to the Delta, they were treated like we were. Everything was very segregated. I mean, it was black, white. We were just really in the middle. I had to attend a segregated one-room schoolhouse. Growing up, I read about segregation, and I, I thought that it only affected the black community. I just didn't really think that it happened to the Chinese, too. What? Great-grandpa! Oh, my 
Shot. I knew all your family. It is so important for people to know what happened with the Chinese Exclusion Act and how it affected Chinese Americans throughout the nation, including the South. Streaming now on GBH World Channel. Well, I'm going to welcome in my co-producer of Far East, Deep South, and that is Mr. Baldwin Chu. He's, Whoa. He's making an entrance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did we sign an insurance waiver? No. Oh, no. Uh, we have rental insurance. So you're my co-producer. Uh -huh. You're also my partner for in, life. In crime. Yes. Partner in crime. We <laughs> are married, if you didn't know that. Oh, so that's good for me to know. That is very good for you to know. And... We took this trip six years ago to Mississippi and hilarity ensued. No, uh, tears, <laughs> tears started flowing. Yeah. Why did, why did you decide to look into your father's history more? Well, really, um, it was for my daughter. I mean, I, I didn't know what a relationship with a grandfather actually was until I saw my daughter being held by my dad. And so when we went out to Mississippi for the first time, or when we found out about my grandfather and great-grandfather being buried in Mississippi, we thought it would be a good time, good opportunity to go out there. You know, and I thought it was just astounding that there were more than just your grandfather and great-grandfather buried in Mississippi. I thought they were going to be the only Chinese there. And when we stepped into the Mississippi Delta Heritage Museum, and I just saw families, generations, so many people that had been in the South, and yet we never heard about that. That was just so surprising to me and why mm -hmm. we really wanted to make the film as well. Uh, what has been the re response from people so far to your family's story? Well, certainly a lot of people, um, was able were able to relate to the uh, Asian American experience, especially the Asian Americans here uh, about about um, how my father wasn't really willing to share, or it was how difficult it was to talk about the past. But I think overall, in general, um, uh, the response has been really great because people are are learning things that we didn't even know. Right? We they're learning about this history. They're learning about um, this unknown, told untold story of the early Chinese in the segregated. Uh, South. And a lot of people are just amazed that this history was never taught to them and, and that they're finding it now now. Right. And I really love the fact that a lot of people have been saying, like, we need this to be taught in schools. And that was a lot of the reason we made the film as well, is that we want to really broaden the way that American history is taught so that it's more inclusive of not just the a API experience, but but other groups that have been traditionally underrepresented. Now, there's a famous scene in our film hmm. that we'll try not to spoil too much. Some of you may have seen the film, um, but we, we go into the, the Mississippi Delta Heritage Chinese Museum and we find a specific artifact, a very important book. I'll spoil a little bit. So we find your grandfather's Bible. Just, just, slight, just, slight spoiler alert. There's plenty of other spoilers. There's other, no, there's <laughs> there's other, other amazing, amazing re revelations in there. And we didn't plan this at all. No. A lot of people are like, oh, is that stage? I'm like, no, when everything that you see in our film, it happens as it happened. As it happened. So a lot of people want to know, where is the Bible now? Where is that Bible now? Well, hopefully you saw the film. And if you haven't yet, uh, you will get a chance to. And you'll see that this spoiler of the Bible being revealed is in the in the in the Delta Museum. In Cleveland, Mississippi, it is still yes, there. It is but, now on loan. But they did give us the Bible back. It does belong to us now. But yes, it is back on loan at the museum. Um, where it is safe and for all to enjoy. So go visit the museum. Right? Yes. When it's safe to travel. When it's safe to it's travel. It's a little bit more safe now. What were some surprising lessons that you took from searching out your grandfather's past? Because we really didn't know we were going to find anything. I mean, we literally thought we would take a family trip, visit a gravesite, and then come home. And, and here we are. We made a whole documentary about it. And how might this be something that we kind of teach our daughter and, you know, hopefully other generations about family history? 
Well, de definitely um, learning about family history, I believe now is important. When I get, I guess when I was younger, I didn't think much of it because I didn't know that it would really apply to me, right? But understanding not only our family's history, but the history of our nation, I think really helps our children understand where they belong. Uh, I definitely want my daughter to grow up. Um, well, is this, can we give a spoiler? I, she's a multi-generational American, let's just say that. And I don't want her to grow up and I don't, to, uh, thinking that she doesn't belong in this country. And I don't want her friends to look at her or strangers to meet her for the first time to look at her and, and automatically assume that she is not an American or she doesn't belong in this country. Yeah, and, and we talk about identity and this sense of belonging as a big theme in our film. And, and the whole idea that, you know, if you look at an Asian face, um, you don't necessarily think we belong here. And I would say several, several other groups also experience that Latinx community, the Arab American community, where the default thinking is, oh, we must not be from here. Mm -hmm. And so why is it important for us to kind of dispel the perpetual foreigner myth? Well, I mean, the film starts out um, with, with a statement where I'm, I'm contemplating in my mind when people meet me for the first time and they ask me, hey, so where are you from? And I would just say, well, you know, San Francisco, I was born in San Francisco, raised in Sacramento. And, and the, the next question is almost always, but where are you really from, right? And they're, they're insinuating that I am not really from America, right? It doesn't matter how many generations I go back, I'm not from here, I'm not here, you know? And so I, I think that's really the, the, um, the, the, the context of how I would feel is we would really want people to understand that our belonging. Yeah, and why again is this important for us to push this out, you know, into the education system and to just the general public in general? In yeah, I mean, all this, unfortunately, I mean, you, we're, we're hearing about all these recent anti-Asian things going on. And when, when we hear about these anti-Asian American things, it's really not anti-Asian American, it's really anti-American. But the problem is that so many people in our country don't view us as American. They only see us as a foreigner. So I think understanding our history, understanding our place, understanding the significance of all the different Asian communities for hundreds of years, not just like 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, it's for hundreds of years, I think it's very important. Now, what was some other surprising things that we discovered when we went to Mississippi? Well, certainly the, um, the discovery of the early Chinese Americans living in the same community as neighbors with a black community. Um, something I definitely was not expecting, did not really understand, and to see that they had a common, um, common shared history and common, um, uh, common struggles and the, the ability to work with each other, um, you know, live in harmonious conditions with each other and understand each other and even fight for each other. Well, I think that was one of the things that was very surprising to me as well was the fact that we kind of lose sight of where we are in history now versus back then in a pre-civil rights era where people of color could not walk in through the front door of businesses and establishments. And the fact that a lot of the Chinese owned businesses, even black owned businesses, you know, people could walk through the front door, you know, someone African American can walk through a Chinese grocery store, which is what the majority of Chinese in that area eventually operated grocery stores, just like your grandfather and your great grandfather. Yeah, certainly that was a testimonial we got from the black community and it was amazing for them to actually, uh, I mean, I was actually, we were worried that they wouldn't want to talk to us because we, we were just, you know, different, but that wasn't the case. They loved talking with us. They loved sharing their stories. They loved thinking about when they were children and all the relationships they had when they were children with the early Chinese grocery store owners and their children. And it really touched my heart and, and it, it teared me up a lot of times during these interviews. Well, and your dad goes through a, a very emotional journey, speaking of tearing up, yes. what has that experience been like for him and maybe even for you and him as father and son? Well, um, I mean, for those that don't understand really the Asian American um, culture, maybe I should say, is, is that like a lot of us, especially the older generations, first time immigrants um, don't show their emotions. They're, they're very and they go through a tough time and they really don't want our, their children to really experience that. It's not like in America, it's like, show us your feelings. Like my dad was like, what feelings, right? He was like, he didn't have any feelings. My, my favorite line in our film is when one of the older gentlemen, it's like the, his parents just, when he was being, you know, had racist taunts thrown at him, he's like, just suck it up. Yeah. And my dad wouldn't even address them. He wouldn't even tell me to suck it up. He'd just like, just go on, just whatever, right? Um, but I think after this experience, um, he he really understands the, the the importance of sharing your stories with each other. It's okay to to show emotions and 
And I, even though he's still a very private person, he doesn't really like seeing himself uh, cry <laughs> on, on TV and letting people see him cry. I think he understands that the emotions is important because it humanizes the things that we have all gone through and it humanizes who we all are. And, and, and those things are just um, that, that, that makes people think of you differently. Yeah, and I know that we have a couple of questions here specifically to our, our film. And it's like, is there a large Chinese community there now? And what are the race, race relations like today among whites, blacks, and Asian Americans? Uh, in that area, there are fewer Chinese there now. In fact, the uh, store owner um, that's in our film just recently sold his store. Uh, so he's no longer there. But, um, but there are still Chinese people in the Mississippi Delta. There's just not as many of them. Yeah, and certainly the race relationships are slightly different. I mean, you know, they're actually we're we're talking about this with our friends Gilroy Chow and and Eddie Gong who still live mm -hmm. there. Um, they actually feel safer there than they they do looking Going at to the kind big of city, right? the, the big cities, um, because well, they've been so integrated with the community now. Well, all that comes down to relationships, and I think that's what our film really highlights is it's the relationships of the people that are the most important things. And so, when they're in a town where everybody knows everybody, the Chinese knows the blacks, knows the whites, and and they're all kind of together they have friendships, they have relationships. It's, it's harder to be fearful of somebody that you actually know, right? Yeah, and, and to be clear, there is still some tension between the white and the black community. I think mm -hmm. those deep seeds of slavery and segregation, the impact of that, there, there is still to an extent a, a mistrust um, from communities, but on an individual relationship, um, things have been in a better place. And, you know, this kind of kind of goes to the question when we have another attendee saying, were Asian Americans seen as a cushion between black and white communities? And did AAPI members have their own neighborhoods? Um, so the AAPI community mainly no, live in the black, in the black neighborhoods. neighborhoods. There was no they Chinatown in the, in the South. Yeah, they couldn't live in the white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And they were, in a sense, in the middle where they were able to forge friendships with both the white and the black community over the generations. I mean, we actually heard from uh, some, some of the black citizens that were saying like when the, ch first, the Chinese first came to the Delta, when they were recruited to replace um, some of the freed slave labor, they were actually looked down upon yeah, as even less, <laughs> less than um, the black community as really foreign, you know, in foreign people. Um, so, you know, over time, the, the definition of race, I think in the South has also changed. Um, so what do you hope people will take away from the film? Well, I, I definitely hope people will normalize the understanding and conversation of what it means to be Asian American and that they really are able to consider us as Americans to understand that there's been contributions. There has been discriminations. There's unfortunately dark history in our country, but that doesn't mean that we can't understand and know that history to to learn how we got to we are today because uh, we really are, we're all trying to make the future better in this country and for us to ignore the past isn't going to help us create a better future yeah and you can retain your cultural identity and heritage just like somebody who's italian american or irish american and and still be you know asian american and yet we want the general american public to accept us as american that's yes so that's why we're celebrating these stories. You're going to see a whole diverse array of other stories. We're going to go now from Mississippi to New York to meet a young group of performers. This is Curtain Up. PS124 yes, Theater Club is an award-winning after-school program based in Chinatown. Most of our kids are Asians. You know, Asians can perform. There's something about music and dance that moves the soul. This is about being a part of America. I like everything about acting. I don't know how to describe it, I just like it. I don't have a lot of confidence. I don't know why, actually. It's easier to be scared than happy. <laughs> Asian Me, not you. You. Yeah, because I'm Chinese Asian. <laughs> I'm 100% Chinese. You why not He slides with China in the Olympics and I say with the US. Yeah. And she gets so angry. And you know what my mom told me? Asian people are horrible at acting. Cannot be. Cannot be acting. This is important. This is your last show here. You have to be proud of this. Charlotte, that's so good. Be, the, be a good girl. That's what this point is, okay? Be a good girl. That's not okay, Russell. That's not holding hands. This is holding hands, right? You guys can do it too. Whose foot was involved with William's head? I did it. I didn't 
I'm not doing this. I didn't kick in his head or smack him. It's probably like a second dream after realizing that it doesn't get you a lot of money. And then, then I'll finally realize acting isn't my real thing. But I still won't give up and I'll still do acting. I thought I could really actually maybe become an actor, but you don't know when life throws you curveballs, so you never know. Streaming now on GBH World Channel. Let's welcome the filmmaking team from Curtain Up, Hui Tong and Kelling Ng. And Kelly and Hui are actually coming in from Asia. So thank you for, I think it's in the middle of the night. Is that correct? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hey, Yan. Well, well, thank you for staying up late with us. Um, I want to just say I haven't had a chance to talk to you both about the film, but when I first saw it, I felt such a strong connection because I was a theater kid. I started doing theater when I was seven years old, and had I not been Asian American, I would have been a theater major in college. And so this was such an important film, I think, for us to, to see. How did you learn about the school and why did you decide to feature the, this school and these kids? Cool. Um, I'm so happy to hear about your connection to theater. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, so, you know, it was summer 2018 and it was when uh, Crazy Rich Asians, Crazy Rich Asians come out, you know, like, and everyone was talking about Asian representation in Hollywood. And um, I was also a theater enthusiast in college. I did a lot of directing and acting in theater. So um, I was thinking, like, uh, how about the theater, you know, Asian American theater communities? Uh, and, you know, New York City is the center of, you know, kind of like theater. So I just started out uh, doing research and reporting on the Asian uh, and Asian American theater communities. And, you know, it's quite interesting because what, uh, what are for, more familiar for us if we define Asian American theater is either, you know, an Asian cast doing Asian story, like Asian theater piece, or, you know, like Asian actors doing, you know, in a very diverse cast doing like non-Asian or, you know, Western shows. Um, but what I've been seeing more and more nowadays is like Asian cast reproducing or like, uh, like remaking mainstream and classic pieces. So it's like making the mainstream things like Asian. So that's kind of the third way of doing theater for now. Um, so I just found out this, um, you know, uh, theater program, um, Bayek Lee, who's the founder of the theater club and the, prince, and the principal, uh, Alice Hong. Um, so they have this great um, theater program in the Chinatown school. So the school, Yongwen School is the, basically at the center of the Chinatown. It's like serving like, you know, over 95% Asian American kids. So, um, you know, I heard about this theater club. It's like all like Chinese or Asian American kids doing like, Disney shows, like mainstream, uh, you know, iconic American shows. So that's kind of like naturally having certain like cultural tension there. Um, you know, I visited the school, I saw the kids doing Aladdin at, at that time. Uh, you know, that was, and the kids were super, super energetic and, you know, welcoming. So I basically, I started shooting the next day after my visit and um, Kelly joined me like a month later. So yeah, that's how the journey began. Well, I love hearing that because I think the AAPI representation in theater just historically has been sorely lacking. And again, I mentioned that's a lot of the big reason I didn't go into theater. I did get a chance to collaborate. Um, I'm also a music composer in addition to being a documentary filmmaker, and I have been a performer too. And so you're right. I have been asked to audition for all the Asian roles in all the musicals. And I worked with C.Y. Lee, who had written the, the, the Flower Gem song. And, you know, for us to even, he had a track record with Rodgers and Hammerstein. And for us to even try to mount even a new musical, we, we, we felt a lot of resistance. You know, what is the message that um, you hope to convey about Asian American Pacific Islanders and the theater through your film? I think, um, well, I, I, I hope we've tried to incorporate some of this into the film that each of these children, because we kind of spotlighted a couple of the kids and their experiences are very unique and different from one another, depending on like their family background and just their interests. Some of them are in theatre because they want to be actors and actresses. Some of them are in theatre because, you know, they just want to, it's kind of like uh, an activity for them to be engaged in outside of like their schoolwork. So, I think what we really hope to convey is that there's no one single defining Asian American experience. Um, and also looking at uh, their family, you know, their relationships with their family members and how, you know, this whole idea of like pursuing your dreams, um, it's, it's easy to trot out a cliche like that, but that there are, you know, different factors that sort of like complicated. Um, uh, and yeah, it's like, 
so we we just really hope that this would be timely um at a time uh, in a season like that where you know there's increasing i guess you could call it misunderstanding um uh, within uh towards the asian american community that this could sort of just um bring some cheer and that you know our viewers can see that um kid, the ups and downs of these kids growing up and developing their senses of self yeah, adorable kids. You can't go wrong with that formula. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Do you think this theater club has changed the trajectory for any of the kids to pursue the arts? And perhaps more importantly, have any parents' minds been changed? Um, I think for the kids themselves, of, of course, you know, I think at their age, you know, they're like age 10 or 11. They actually need like, you know, constant support and encouragement. And um, definitely the, the existence of this theater club kind of constantly reminding them that they can do arts, they can do theater. And, you know, during the pandemic, although the kids were staying at home, but, you know, uh, some of the teachers in the theater club are still hosting online theater, theater camps. And some of the main characters, the main kids in our film is actually still doing online theater camps. And they're sending us the links of their, like, you know, YouTube links of them performing with other kids online. So I guess, you know, yeah, they're still doing well. And I guess definitely the theater club has been a, you know, very important part in their life. You know, we, we cannot tell if they're, actually going to be actors or actresses in the future. But, you know, this is definitely an important part of your life. Yeah. yeah and Kelly, yeah. how about the parents? Like what, what has, have you kept in touch with them? And, you know, have you seen them change their attitudes? I think, well, I'm, I'm also trying to not spoil the film too much, but I think throughout our, our experiences uh, filming with them for, I guess, like over a year, we have sort of like noticed the parents, um, not necessarily a very evident change, but their own struggles of wanting to support um, their kids and their interests, but at the same time, you know, not really sure. Uh, maybe this is something that you can resonate with, whether this is something, um, this is a career path that, you know, it's, it's a stable and, you know, it's a respectable job and things like that. So I think we, we have have sort of um, seen the parents um, share this with us and like their very raw emotions and just the interactions with their kids when they talk about things like that. Yeah, absolutely. That struggle between, you know, wanting something stable for your children and yet encouraging to pursue something creative um, and pursue something that they might be passionate about. And that's definitely a, a very common struggle. Um, we have another question from the audience. Um, with the Crazy Rich Asian films, programs like this, and um, I guess all our films, do you think we are seeing a blossoming of AAPI theater and art in America? That's a great question. I think we're definitely seeing a good time like a great time as we can hope for you know if you just look at the you know oscars in the past three years right or other major you know uh, film festivals or like awards and we can definitely see more and more you know first something award from asian or asian women or you know um other filmmakers or like artists so yeah i mean i guess so but you know there's, there's still more stories you know because asian American community itself is also a very diverse group you know has like definitely more stories to tell and that's why we also focus on the children in our film because they're the future storytellers, you know, and we can we can hope for better things, I guess. Yeah, and why why do you feel like this theater program was so important for these kids? I think, well, I think it's very special because, well, as Hui mentioned, it is the school is right in the heart of Chinatown, New York, and most of them are Asian Americans, and they don't, well, as we have talked about earlier, that they don't traditionally um, have many opportunities to do theater, to do the arts. And the fact that there's a theater program that sort of pushes them um, beyond this traditional confines, I think um, gives them a lot of exposure. And they get to go on, um, uh, there's this uh, junior theater festival that's uh, held annually and kids from all over the country, all over the world actually come and present an item. And these kids get to go uh, for opportunities like that. So I think it's, it's really character shaping, confidence building. And I think it helps them to explore different options for, for the future as well. Um, absolutely. Um, I mean, what is your hopes in terms of being able to impact the theater community? Um, have other members of the theater and Broadway community seen the film? Hui or Kelly? Can you hear me? Um, oh. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Okay. We're actually, yeah, we're, we're still in the process of doing community outreach, but, you know, definitely there are theater people, you know, especially, you know, we, we, we received 
personal like private messages from you know uh uh prospect prospective uh Asian American artists or you know at, at actors or actresses telling us you know how kind of touched they were like and how they encouraged they were by the kids you know kind of like um um like resonating with their experience growing up so I guess yeah it's definitely um making some impact on the theater community uh and yeah we're definitely glad that more and more people you know especially uh with our streaming on our channel there'll be more and more mm -hmm. people seeing that and yeah I hope well, we are so glad that Curtain Up is part of this lineup of films. So um, thank you both for joining us. And you're going to be back a little later as well as Baldwin. We're going to bring all the filmmakers together um, towards the end of our conversation if you're just joining us now. And now we go from New York to different parts of the country where we're going to be following some first time voters. This is First Vote. Being able to vote is a privilege. Not everybody gets to vote in the world. Asian Americans are the country's fastest growing ethnic group, but until recently, they haven't voted in large numbers. Now, they're finding their voices at the polls. In America's battleground states, how will these voters choose? Make America great again! When I think about how I, I want more Asian Americans to participate in American political life, this is not what I had in mind. This is a democratic process. First vote on America Reframed. Let's welcome the director of First Vote, Yi Chen. Welcome, Yi. How are you doing? Hi, Larissa. Good to see you. It's great to see you. And you have actually, uh, I know, worked. you worked on this film for the 2016 um, election. And uh, now we've gone through another election cycle. Um, what what have you seen maybe has changed um, in the, from the past election to this more recent election? Oh. Uh... Especially like here, let me let me back that up. Okay. <laughs> um, do you do you feel like this film is still relevant today um, as it was back then when you first? Because I think it gives great insight to voters. And how did you decide upon these four voters? Um, yeah, so um, you know, I started the project in 20 um uh, after the 2016 um election. So the story follows actually four voters. Um organizing in North Carolina, North Carolina and Ohio from 2016 to 2018. So the storyline really focused on the 2018 midterms. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, so the four voters, I have two, so two of them are Republicans and two of them are Democrats. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, relevant, um, uh, you know, even when I, Actually, you know, this film is very special because it was released last year and it was also my first time voting um, in 2020. Um, so having made this film and, you know, also voting in 2020, um, I you, it definitely I feel like I have a much better understanding of voters in my own community. Um, and the film really um, started out with a very personal connection because um, I am an immigrant, um, you know, I came to the US in 2003. So in 2016, um, I actually was going through the naturalization process and um, becoming a first time voter myself. So um, I was uh, interested in understanding voters in my own community on both sides, it's, uh, particularly um, first time voters like myself. Um, so um, when I, started working on the project in 2017, I was looking for um, characters um, in battleground states. And I was, and, and I found these, these four characters and I was um, interested in under, understanding um, how their lived experiences shape um, who they are and, um, and how they vote. 
Yeah. And I, I think I was struck by that because you really kind of followed them into their personal lives and their experiences. And I think that gave great insight to these voters. Now, how did you deal with the co complexity? I mean, you, you kind of mentioned it a little bit here of, of how API voters, because even with these four, um, that doesn't necessarily represent everyone, but you know, you know, how, what was your approach in terms of being able to show all those different sides of them? Yeah, so I think from a filmmaking perspective, um, I the film is, you know, it's a character driven and it's observational film. So I filmed for two years and really um, spent a lot of time with these um, these characters and um, getting to know them and understand who they are. Um, and um, I also had very um, unique access um, at the time. Um, to uh, be able to have access to both sides. Um, it was, you know, it's, it's, it was a very divisive time. And um, actually one of the first questions, so I actually don't know if I would, um, it would be the same film if I were to make it now, because um, at the time, one of the first questions that I was asked, um, uh, particularly um, uh, voters uh, who um, are Republicans was, are you, you know, like Sue and Lance, they just asked me when I first talked to them, are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Um, so at the time um, I told them, you know, I was becoming a citizen and voting, about to vote for the first time. Um, and I was really interested in learning more about um, voters in my own community and how democracy works. Um, so, so that I think, you know, was a very unique situation that gave me um, the access and I was able to um, spend a lot of time with them and build uh, relationships and build trust and and, um, and really um, very intimate access to um, to their lives. Well, you bring up a really interesting point because, you know, as a first time voter, you're almost like asked to pick a team. Right. And you're and you're like, this is my first time. So what what else was surprising and what else did you learn as a first time voter? Yeah, I mean, I learned a lot. I learned so much. Um, and, you know, because I didn't grow up here and I came here for graduate school, um, I think a lot of the things that um, uh, Asian Americans who are born and grew up here will learn um, about uh, as an undergraduate about Asian American history, um, you know, like history of voting rights for Asian Americans. I was really um, I didn't know that um, Asian Americans didn't have voting rights until uh, 19, 1952 and Jennifer and Kaiser's parents um, weren't, uh, they wouldn't be, have, be able to um, immigrate here if it wasn't uh, for the Immigration Act of 1965. Um, and so just, you know, a lot, a lot about um, Asian American history and also um, specifically because I, because the story um, took place in North Carolina and Ohio, at the time in 2018, um, North Carolina had uh, the voter ID law on the ballot and Ohio, um, Ohio had a, a big uh, voter purge um, going on in 2018. So those are the two um, things that I, um, you know, got to know a lot more because uh, I was working on this um, film. Um, and I think what you um, and Baldwin said earlier um, about, you know, the perpetual foreigner um, stereotype and, you know, model minority that I have um, personally experienced, but I just, I really didn't understand it at the time and um, working on this film. And there's a scene, um, Kaiser's daughter, um, you know, she talked about being asked where you're from. Um, it, it made me realize I'm not alone. Um, and, and talking to Jennifer, who is a um, critical race theory professor and anti-racism educator, um, you know, she um, taught classes on Asian American identity in the South. Um, and it really made me also think about my own identity um, as an Asian American. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought those themes. And, you know, when I saw that scene in your film, too, I was like, yep, see how common it is? Where are you from? Where are you really from? You just can't get away from it. Uh, we have a question from the audience um, from Victoria. Have you checked back in with these voters to hear the reactions to the 2020 presidential election? Uh, yeah, we actually um, we actually had a panel last year with all four of the characters. Um, uh, 
so I actually, um, if you're interested, um, it's actually the recording is on our website, <laughs> firstbookfilm.com, that you can actually check out that panel. Um, I, you know, I would say that um, 2020 versus what you see in the film, it's actually, they're still the same uh, when it comes to, um, you know, voting and, and their political um, uh, views. Um, it's, you know, they're still, pretty much the same, I would say. That's very, very interesting. And people can be sure to check that out on your website. Um, speaking of one of your voters, I believe she's on here, Jennifer Ho. <laughs> she's got a comment and question for anyone interested in learning more about Asian Americans in the US South. I highly recommend Leslie Bow's Partly Colored, which talks about Asian Americans in the US South. And um, maybe we'll add that to our list of resources on our website. Um, her question for Yi, and she realizes she could just ask her on the phone, but I think she wants the audience to hear. Um, you, she wants to know your thoughts on the article that just came out about the number of Chinese and Chinese Americans who contributed to the Proud Boys ahead of the January 6th insurrection. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the article um, or if you um, have a response to that. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, um, the journalist, he actually, uh, uh, I, I did talk to him when he was working on the article. Um, you know, before he approached me, I actually didn't know much about um, uh, Chinese diaspora, Chinese Americans donating to um, the Proud Boys, which, um, you know, then, you know, then I think about it in retrospect, it's actually not that surprising um, because a lot of them um, are, uh, you know, supporters of uh, voted for Donald Trump in 2016, 2020. So it actually, you know, it, it does make sense. But um, I actually um, went back to uh, to one of the things that um, the reporter was interested in was um, because when I was working on the film, I was actually um, invited to join um, conservative uh, uh, groups on WeChat, which um, uh, conservative Chinese American voters use this as an organizing tool and communications tool. Um, so uh, I, you know, I searched for keywords, Proud Boys, and, and um, uh, specifically that fundraiser around December last year. And, and so, you know, and I actually found, um, so I, by the way, I don't go actually go into those group and read um, the post um, often at all. Um, but, you know, I went in and I actually found actually a lot of uh, surprisingly so many um, posts that are about that fundraiser and people donated. Um, so I think, it, it reminds me of when I first started doing research for um, for uh, for the film, um, like Lance, who um, is featured in the film, that he actually founded a um, a PAC, and um, it's a national organization. They not only organize nationally to support Republican candidates, but they also um, they also donate through um, SEC um, and, you know, he also worked on voter database. So they're actually more involved. Um, they're involved in a, a, a very, um, very deep level, right? So, um, and, and I do like encourage you to check out that article, which actually um, uh, the journalist actually interviewed Jennifer and Kaiser in that article. Well, we want to thank you, um, Yi, for joining us today. And you're going to be back with the rest of our group of filmmakers in a little bit. Um, please check out First Vote. It is fascinating. Um, and now we are going to head over to Michigan to take a look at Hamtramck, USA. I used to collect the list of graduates every year because I was really interested in the last names of the graduates and watched that list of names shift to Bosnians in the early 90s, and then more and more Bangladeshi names and Yemeni names. And I've realized that I am probably the last in the 100-year line of Polish mayors. Hamtramck, Michigan, has become the first Muslim-majority city in America.
Inshallah, you support me November 7th as well. Inshallah, we unify together as one. And inshallah, we accomplish the unaccomplished prior. If you like to change, I have some idea to restructure and modify the administration. If you care about this community and community's honor, come out and vote. I feel confident and happy. This is our, this is our time to shine. Ami e chatita amar barita council korta Hassan er nikot peke piachi. Tini lekechen je tini Bangladeshi, Yemeni, Polish, African American ebum, American der shate kash korache. Kintu nerbochoner den amra Polish American, African American, Yemeni, Opola, Bangladeshi, Erikona Taina. Amro to buy Holland Tremekin. People didn't even think about who is being a president of the United States, and tonight they want to know who will be the mayor of Amtremek. Coming soon on GBH World Channel. I'm happy to welcome the filmmakers of Hamtramck USA, Justin Feltman and Rosie Joffrey. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Hi, thank you so much for having us. Great to see you guys. Um, first off, why did you decide to make this film about the Muslim community in Hamtramck and the impact on local politics? Uh, yeah, so in the 2016 election, I uh, had come up to Michigan to work on a project around uh, underrepresented voices in American democracy. And on working on that project, I met Razi and he kind of helped connect me with some Muslim leaders in the community locally there in uh, Southeast Michigan. And as the election results came in, um, we kind of thought, well, where do we go from here? And what can we do in this time to kind of, you know, as, as filmmakers, as first time filmmakers, how can we kind of, you know, share our story, an important story we felt. And we wanted to kind of, talk about Hamtramck when we, we came across Hamtramck and we really thought this would be, make a great film. And we saw they had a mayoral election the next year and it just immediately clicked for us that this would be the story we needed to tell. It was a movie, or I mean, it was a community with a lot of negative press that kind of did this clash of the civilizations talk, uh, you know, in the film, you know, a CNN host asks the mayor of Hamtramck, um, you know, that, hey, you're from a Muslim majority city, are you afraid? I mean, you know, this is the kind of narratives that were being talked about and we thought that's not this community at all. And so I immediately just left my camera equipment with Razi, said, I'm gonna move up here in a few months, just start shooting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's how we kind of got started. I know I was appalled when I heard that comment by that reporter. And, mm -hmm. you know, Razi, why does Ham Tramick attract such a diverse immigrant population. Give us a little backstory on the history there. Yeah, um, it's it's a great question. It's it's a very um, unique uh, community. Um, I think like a lot of places in, in the United States that have drawn um, immigrants from different backgrounds, uh, it's a combination of things. Uh, it's, it's sort of familial uh, chain migration. It's also people moving there to look for jobs, um, a better quality of life. Uh, you also have a lot of people moving to places like Hamtramck from New York because it's a lot cheaper to live there uh, as well. Uh, you have a huge influx of people coming in, um, you know, throughout the course of the 20th century uh, to work in the automotive industry as well. Uh, I think the economics is the primary driver of what brought people there. Uh, another factor uh, historically in Hamtramck has been uh, uh, refugee and asylum seekers um, as well. Uh, so you had a lot of uh, refugees coming in from the Balkans in the mid 90s. And then more recently, we've had a lot of refugees due to the um, Arab Spring in the Middle East and the uh, sort of turmoil that has been taking place in the contemporary Middle East. So we've had refugees from Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, Yemen uh, that have been resettled in uh, Hamtramck as well more recently. Well, and I love the fact that it is so diverse. And, you know, in our film, Far East Deep South, we focus on the diversity in the Mississippi Delta. And there was actually a Lebanese population there when the Chinese were there as well. And, and now we're looking at Michigan, a different state and a different part of the country. And of course, you guys are looking on a different side of the coin than first vote was, where you're actually looking at the candidates. Um, and so uh, what does democracy look like in a Muslim majority city? You know, it, it's it's a great question, and it's one of the things that you know we get asked 
about a lot, you know, since working on this film. And uh, I think, you know, if you've seen the film, uh, one of the things that becomes apparent is that democracy in a Muslim majority city looks like democracy in really any other place. It's, uh, it's messy and beautiful uh, and complicated um, all at the same time. Uh, and I think one of the other things that you really learn from the experience of the film and the experience of the city is that the people that are getting involved in politics, they're taking up you know, these leadership positions, they're running for office, their main concern is a better quality of life for everybody in town. One of the stereotypes that gets levied against uh, immigrants and uh, other minorities who run for office or get involved in politics is that they only care about their own community. Uh, but there are a, lot, are a lot of issues in places like Hamtramck that affect every single citizen. So um, clean water, uh, for, for example, it's a big issue in Michigan, uh, has been an issue in Detroit and different parts of the Southeast Michigan. Uh, safety, uh, good schools, um, better roads, you know, uh, these are all things that um, any politician um, would be concerned with uh, for running for office in the, in the area. And I think that's one of the things that's exemplified in the campaigns of the people running for office. And that kind of answers one of our viewers' questions about the biggest issues in the election. Um, anything else that's unique to the city? I wouldn't say unique, but, you know, they, they are, as Razi said, a lot of the, the, the concerns are infrastructure of the city. Um, another big concern, you know, it is Southeast Michigan and, you know, it's a little bit of a post-industrial kind of town. For so long, it was held up by the auto industry. And since that has kind of faded, they're still kind of looking for that. Uh, kind of replacement, and that's just not easily found. So, I mean, you know, that is something that people will talk about is a need to kind of find on the south end of town when when it be, was originally a Polish town, there was the Dodge Main. And, you know, that became later uh, a, a GM plant, and that's kind of now been shifting, and they're trying to find, uh, I think, automated cars is the next thing that they're they're planning on for the factory. But, you know, there, there's that, and there's American Axle, so there's stuff like that, that there, you know, it is a working class town that's still looking for those kinds of um, solutions that, you know, once were so, so promising in the region. Yeah. And talk a little bit about how, you know, there's different languages spoken in the city. So does language, did language seem to be a barrier for voting and for even volunteers to be able to communicate with those who, during the voting process? Well, I think one of the things that ends up happening is uh, that uh, in, in, in a place like this, in order to be a savvy and successful politician, uh, you have to um, cater to constituents of all different backgrounds. And so that's one of the things that we see, you know, particularly with um, Karen, for example, uh, the incumbent uh, mayor that's running for re-election, um, is, is very good at, um, you know, visiting different houses of worship, uh, attending, you know, different celebrations and things like that. You know, we saw also an, um, another candidate um, who's not prominently featured in the film, but um, Ian Parada, who has his uh, signs uh, and campaign materials translated into multiple languages, uh, which is really incredible because you see Bangladeshi candidates have their signs, of course, in Bangladeshi and English, but then in multiple other signs in Polish and English and, you know, uh, different languages that um, are targeting the constituents, um, you know, in, in the city. So it definitely plays a role. And I think the way that the candidates handle it is that they, they try to address it head on and they try to target um, those voters uh, by addressing them in their native languages. Yeah, and, and, and speaking of the candidates, um, you know, for themselves and in terms of entering local politics, you know, how hard was it to break in and also be the, the, new, the front runners and in sense uh, to become the new front runners in this majority of residents of Muslim in, in Hamtramck? It's, it's really tough, you know, they're really up against uh, a lot of things. And I think, you know, we would be remiss to not acknowledge the trailblazers um, who ran for office, um, you know, before and decades prior. Uh, so Hamtramck in the early 2000s had a, a city council member, Shahab Ahmed, um, who faced uh, extreme prejudice uh, and lots and lots of problems, uh, you know, racism and, um, you know, different types of problems, bo both in his campaign and as his uh, tenure on city council. Um, in fact, he had to seek uh, police protection, uh, oh. you know, for himself and his family, and eventually had to move out of Hamtramck because things were just so tenuous, you know, and, and so 
uh, challenging for him, you know, of being there. But what he was able to do was set a precedence that blazed a trail and opened doors for people to come much later on. And then, of course, in the elections in uh, 2011 and 2013 and 2015, uh, you know, both the kind of the city midterm elections and the city kind of the, the wider mayoral elections in the cities, you're slowly starting to see more and more people uh, get involved. And I think it was 2015 when Hemtramck eventually ended up electing a Muslim majority city council represented. Uh, by people from, uh, you know, Bangladesh and Yemen. Um, and then in the 2017 election, you also had Fadl al-Marsumi, who um, joined the city council, who's from an Iraqi background. Um, and so I think, you know, the, 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 the sort of seeds for what happened today and the, this flourishing uh, and burgeoning, you know, uh, Muslim uh, campaigns and, and, and political initiatives uh, were planted decades ago, you know, with people getting involved um, earlier on. No, it's, it's important. It, it definitely takes time, but it's great to see some of that progress paying off now. Um, this is a, another great question from our audience. Has Hamtramck, the community, seen the film? What was their response and, and did it differ for different groups of residents? Yeah, so um, we're, we were planning on having the film uh, play at the Freak Film Festival, which is a local uh, Detroit film festival. Obviously, because of COVID, it's been postponed. So hopefully this fall, we'll be able to bring it to the community. Um, but at Doc NYC, we were able to share the film with the people in the film uh, specifically. And, and we have gotten a few emails from people who live locally and, you know, have some nice things to say. Everyone seems to have appreciated the tone, I think, especially when, you know, you have the, the piece where uh, all the other media coverage where it kind of does this uh, clash of the civilizations kind of talk. It's nice to have a film that actually gives them the voice and allows them to share the story of the city and their own concerns, I think uh, is, is a big draw for a lot of the people locally to feel that. Well, um, I think it's a remarkable film that gives insight in, into another region of our country that, again, most people aren't aware of. Um, thank you, Justin and Razi, um, for being here and making this film. Don't go anywhere because now we're going to bring the rest of our filmmakers <laughs> back um, for a it's not really a round table when you're on Zoom, but let's say square box panel. <laughs> and we're gonna bring our other filmmakers back. We're gonna bring back uh, Kelly and Hui and Yi, and we're gonna have Baldwin wheel back in over here. <laughs> so I'm gonna move on over. Um, and I know people are still asking questions in the Q&A and we apologize if we don't end up getting to your questions, uh, but we're gonna try our best to get to as many as we can. Here he comes. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this month is AAPI, uh, Heritage Month, um, and we are celebrating these films that are being broadcast and streamed on World Channel this month on America Reframed. Um, so just to kind of pull this, push this out there to all of you, you know, why do you choose what stories, how do you choose what stories to tell? And you can speak to either this current film or even other projects that you choose to tell. Um, anyone who wants to jump in to start. You know, I, I guess I'll kind of start. I think, I think you know, one of the things that's really important is uh, I think a lot of us talked about in our respective like sessions and talking about our projects is it's really important that our stories are told from our own perspectives and and A and then B that these stories are in fact told and uh, and 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 that they get out there because what we're talking about is American history. Uh, and the American political landscape and Asian Americans are uh, an uh, inextricable uh, part of that. So it's really important for this work to be done. You know, for me, I, I think it's about proximity. You know, I'm an immigrant myself from India. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Muslim as well. As a person of color in, and as a religious minority, those communities are most easily accessible to me. And, and I think as a marginalized community that an accurate story needs to be told. So that's kind of what's driving me right now. Um, certainly, I mean, I think we have, we as filmmakers have the power to, to change hearts and minds through the stories that we tell. Um, anyone else wanna chime in on, you know, how you choose the stories and why those stories are important to tell? You can also jump in too, Baldwin, <laughs> even though you're like right well, you next to me. You were looking at me, you were looking at them. <laughs> So, <laughs> I just wanted to reiterate what you just said, because um, I'm, I'm always thinking if, if we don't tell our stories, then either somebody, either nobody else will, or they'll tell it inaccurately. And so it's kind of our job. It's our duty, right? It's actually our, our, 
I mean, if we don't do it, it, it's kind of a disservice to our community. And it's actually a disservice to the greater community, to the entire nation for us not to tell our stories accurately. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just to add to that really quickly, I, I think, you know, we also, uh, on, on some level, we need to move beyond uh, us just talking, just being able to only talk about ourselves. I think that as filmmakers and storytellers, we are also interested in other things, you know, beyond like an Asian American story or beyond a Muslim story, you know, and I, and I really commend, you know, people like Chloe Zhao, you know, with Nomadland, you know, th that we need to be able to tell story, just stories and American stories. Uh, we are all people who are interested um, in other things, you know, beyond our, our primary or secondary identities as well. And so I think we need to be valued for our ability as storytellers and filmmakers and not just Indian or Chinese or Korean filmmakers as well. As I just really wanted to make that point uh, as well. Hey, I'm going to jump in there because I love that comment. Uh, uh, Dr. Robert Voss actually talked to me the other couple of weeks ago. He's in our film. He's a white historian. Uh, and so he was in our film talking about history. And, and he told me, he was like, you know what? Um, history does not belong to us, meaning white people, uh, even though we wrote the history books. And now that I've seen your film and I, I know your history, uh, history doesn't belong to you either being Asian and history doesn't belong to the black community. History just is. And so if we tell everyone's story and allow everyone to tell their stories, and if we don't hide the truth, whether it's good or bad from the past, then we all have a collective understanding of history. And that allows him as a white professor to talk about and teach about slavery and the segregated South. It allows people like us to talk about the white experience or the black experience. It allows black directors and filmmakers and historians to talk like we met a, a black history professor who's teaching on the Chinese Exclusion Act in his university. So it allows if everyone understands that history belongs to all of us, then it also allows us to understand history for all of us and teach it and experience it for everyone else as well. Yeah, very, very good point. <laughs> Um, how about uh, Hui Kelly and um, Yi? You know what what stories you think are important to tell, and and you know what impact do you hope that uh, whether it's these films that we're talking about today or other films that you're working on um, have in the world? I, I you know I totally just want to echo what Razi and Baldwin said. Representation is so important, and AAPIs we have such diverse stories, and you know, but where stories are underrepresented, so it's it's really really important um, to have representation. Um, and I also want to say, as a filmmaker, that we need gatekeepers um, to actually. Um, you know, show our films, give us the platform. Um, so um, I want to thank, you know, War Channel for um, showing all these great um, AAPI stories um, during the May Heritage Month um, and putting together this panel. So we definitely, you know, need more gatekeepers to um, to give us more uh, platforms to, um, to uplift um, AAPI storytellers. Yeah, no, thank you, World Channel um, and the whole team. Um, these are such important stories and you're absolutely right. Gatekeepers are important. Uh, Hui and Kelly, um, you wanna chime in with your thoughts? Sure, yeah. Oh. I mean, I definitely appreciate what, you know, previously, uh, you know, we talked about representing our own community, but I think for me, I mean, as because Turn Up is my, you know, debut feature film, um, I feel like, you know, from from this journey of making a film, I feel like it's, there's, even, even by, you know, kind of like, documenting the story of your own community, there's always the space of self-discovery. You know, it's like ju not, not just, you know, telling stories of people you're familiar with, but, you know, getting to know different people and listening to the stories. There are always new kind of like uh, aspects or, you know, uh, perspectives you can learn from them. And to, be, to me, uh, to be honest, I'm, you know, I'm a, I just came for a, uh, came to U.S. for college. Um, you know, I, I think you mentioned this before. I never, I mean, I've actually not, consider myself an AAPI person before, you know, there's uh, the kind of one of the motivations of making this film is also that kind of seeing, you know, the Chinese or Asian American communities around me, everyone to learn about it, their experience and what kind of differences they have with my own experience growing up in China, finishing my high school in China. So I'd say like, this is like, I think this is one great thing about making a documentary is like, you know, uh, you kind of learn from the people, you know, it, and, and, and I have more thoughts about my own community, my, my own identity, you know, uh, living uh, cross-culturally in the U.S., but, you know, from, from China. So um, I guess, I mean, this is my first film, but I guess this is like really pushing me on this journey of making more films in the future, you know, self-discovery. 
So yeah. cool. No, that's great. Uh, Kelly, you, you, you were about to say something as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I really agree with what everyone said about, um, I think for me, I'm a first time filmmaker as well, and I'm not American, but I think I'm typically quite drawn to stories from the fringes, like stories that are lesser told. And I think that's what all of us are talking about right now. Um, and I think for Curtain Up specifically, I think we, I guess we and I sort of like resonated with the kids in different ways and that culturally um, and just like linguistically or whatever. And that sort of enabled us to tell their story. And I guess what we hope is that, you know, our viewers would see um, a part of themselves in these kids as well, um, regardless of, you know, what color, what community you come from. Yeah, no, absolutely. Some of these themes and, and the characters and, and emotions experiences are universal. Um, I'm going to kind of move this into the current day um, and, and some of the things we've been dealing with in, in the pandemic. And also, as we've seen, um, unfortunately, a recent wave of hate crimes against AAPIEs and just rising xenophobia. Um, you know, how are you dealing with it or addressing it? And how do you hope as filmmakers um, we can help um, address the things that we're seeing in the news? I mean, I think one of the biggest things as storytellers is raising awareness, um, you know, uh, about uh, what's happening. And um, I think, you know, so much uh, goes unreported um, as well. Uh, this is the case, you know, in all kinds of, um, you know, cases of vandalism and prejudice and violence against minority communities. Um, when it comes to anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, you know, even that, you know, so many, so many of these cases, you know, of violence against these communities goes unreported. So I think the big thing as storytellers, as filmmakers, is to be able to raise awareness about these things and uh, to really show what the reality um, truly is. Um, I think that today with the rise and proliferation of like cell phone footage and uh, just other types of footage that we've been seeing of uh, Asian American attacks, uh, it's been quite shocking for people to, to view this footage. Um, but at the same time, it's something that we need to be um, aware of. And so I'm hoping that um, that, you know, throughout all of this negativity that we're seeing that, you know, we will uh, start seeing more stories coming out um, about this and more coverage uh, being, more time being spent to cover this story as well. Um, you know, but I think that's the main thing is that we can just try to raise awareness by telling stories um, about it. Yeah, I mean, when we were working on our film, Far East Deep South, I mean, we, as you all know, it takes several years to make your documentaries. We worked, we started it five years ago and yet, we knew about the identity issues and the perpetual foreigner stereotypes. It's not like people thought we didn't belong here just yesterday. You know, this has been something that has happened for a very, very long time. And so I think as filmmakers, um, you know, we just happen to be in this moment where people are now paying attention to our stories. And like you mentioned, Razi, it's being captured on camera. Before it was like, if a forest falls in a tree, does it, you know, does it make a sound? And now we're seeing that, that these, these, fears and this racism is actually real. Um, anyone else want to chime in on kind of how your films or how films in general can as address some of the some of the news today? I'll jump in since no one's else talking. Yes. Will go you ahead. allow me? Can I, I will I will let you. Okay. Uh, I mean I, I think I think our community, the API community needs to to just uh, understand that you know all these years all these generations that we've been told to like keep our heads down and be silent work through it and everything will be all right um it only goes so far and at some point we can't stay silent we can't just hope that things will get better by not saying or doing anything and i think um that's why i love seeing all of you is that being filmmakers allows us a step to not be silent right and sometimes i think culturally and maybe just through the years of whether you call whether it's the model minority myth that has been pushed onto us or if it's within our own culture to suppress our own our own feelings and and and, and voice i hope that the storytelling will at least give us that first step to say like okay maybe this is my first opportunity to not be silent maybe being silent and just working hard isn't good enough and maybe if everyone else sees that we can speak up and we can learn from other community groups that have raised activism and we can learn from those communities, then maybe we can even join together with other groups and show unity and, 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 um, and not have to perpetuate this silence that we've always had. All right. 
I got, I let you talk. Okay, yes. You. We're married, by the way, if you're just joining us, you didn't know that he's my co-producer of Far East Deep South. Um, this has been an incredibly enlightening conversation. I'm going to ask you guys one last question, kind of go around the horn with everyone. Uh, why should people watch your film? We'll start with um, Rosie and Justin. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's an American story. It's a quintessential American story. And uh, Hamtramck is a town uh, that's very unique. But at the same time, this is a story of many, many towns uh, across the United States in every corner of the country. So it's, it's a story about shifting demographics, but it's also a story about what reality is like in the United States today. And, you know, our hope with the film is to raise awareness about issues around multiculturalism, Islamophobia, immigration, refugees, and uh, kind of some of the issues that they experience in their lives. And, you know, these are not uh, unique issues to just those communities. These are American issues. And so we hope that the film will be, uh, will facilitate some more meaningful and deeper conversations around these topics. So that's why you should watch our film. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to add, Justin? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it, it is a look into to, to small town politics and we really wanted to kind of encourage people that, you know, politics isn't just something you do every four years when the president the presidential election comes up. It's something that you can do on a local level today, any day, um, you know, to get involved in your local community and really create change on a grassroots level is something that we can all do. And, and so we really wanted to encourage um, anyone to see the film and see kind of, you know, this is where politics really begins. It's right outside your front door and, you know, go for it. <laughs> Um, that sounds good to me. Okay, team from Curtain Up, Hui and Kelly, why should people watch your film? Well, I think there are a lot of like universal aspects of the story of Curtain Up. Basically, you know, it's about theater education, it's about parenting and, you know, supporting your children's dreams. It's also about, you know, kids growing up. And I think also, as people talk about, it's kind of going beyond just the API community. But also, I think most importantly is because the school has been closed for so long for the <laughs> pandemic. And, you know, we have to watch how the school life is going on, you know, uh, and what's going on before this. And people can kind of get back naturally to their school life and, you know, can kind of like remember how life was before. So, yeah, that's. Yes. Remember, remember those days when kids got to go to school all together. Um, Kelly, any, any, any other thoughts? Yeah, well, I guess. I mean, I, I think diversity and representation is not like in, in theater, in art, in the arts too, is not a new topic, but there's something precious about seeing it um, from the perspectives of kids and even just knowing that this is something that they think about that, you know, is important to them. And yeah, and they present it in a very adorable way. So I hope <laughs> everyone will catch our film um, and uh, enjoy it. Absolutely. Um, and Yi, first vote, why should people watch? Um, well, I, I'll start by sharing a recent census data that 59.7% um, uh, of AAPIs actually voted in the 2020 election, uh, which is a 10% increase uh, from 2016. Um, so the film is about uh, the power and diversity of um, the Asian American electorate, which is the fastest growing um, and margin of victory in an increasing number of uh, battleground states. Um, and I think you asked about uh, impact, Larissa, um, that I meant to um, add to that um, because the film actually premiered a year ago um, and uh, the encore broadcast is on May 18th. Um, so uh, we actually have partnered with national and local civic engagement organizations to um, reach eligible Asian American voters in um, key battleground states through uh, more than 40 impact screenings and conversations um, to uh, support their efforts to increase Asian American uh, voter outreach, uh, voter registration and turnout in November 2020. Um, and that's something that we will continue to do and hope to engage uh, more partners to address the unique uh, needs and challenges of Asian American voters and work towards the vision that every Asian American voter um, has an equal opportunity to vote in every um, election. Um, so besides that, I <laughs> want to say that it's actually a very engaging film. Um, it, it's, um, uh, it will take you on an emotional journey. Um, and uh, if you are curious about um, uh, Asian or 
American voters um, on both sides, why they vote the way they do. Um, this this is the film, uh, and it's it's a very engaging watch. Uh, you you will you will enjoy watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, all the films are very enjoyable to watch. All right, I'm, I'm going to take over here um, because she let me talk. So thank you all you panelists for your stuff that you've talked about, everything you've said. But now I'm going to ask you, why should you and why should everyone else out there watch Far East Deep South? I'm taking over hosting. OK, that. I see We're we're switch, switching it up here. Well, I think people should watch Far East Deep South um, because your dad is apparently adorable and you've got adorable kids and you've got an adorable senior citizen in our film. Um, <laughs> who <laughs> goes through this emotional journey um, growing up fatherless to reconnect with his roots and this very surprising um, journey to discover this history that he never knew, not just about his family, about this part of American history. And, and more importantly, you will learn something. Um, and from a human level, you will learn something. From a historical level, you will learn something. And I think you'll be better for it when you get to the end of the film. And there's lots of surprises. So if you like a good mystery and you like surprises and twists and turns, definitely our film is when to watch. And um, what we really hope to do is make an impact on the education community. Um, so if you have seen our film and after you've seen our film, um, you can want to reach out to us at fareastdeepsouth.com. Please join our education campaign to get our film into schools and also to broaden the way we teach American history to be more inclusive. Um, so that's why people should watch our film. All right. Should I close it out now? Or do you think you're you'd probably I, I'm going to I'm going to close it out. Oh, yeah, um, first off, I want to thank all our panelists. Um, we have all kind of gone through the same film festival circuit, but this time it's been virtually. So it's like the first time we've all kind of been in this like same area, even though it's virtual. So I want to thank all our panelists. I want to thank World Channel and America Reframed um, for showing our films and also hosting this event. They've got more events coming up on May 13th and May 20th. Uh, please join these events and check out the screen right there the registration and to learn more details about these events please go to worldchannel.org there's a stop aap high hate event and also um, a q a with a pacific heartbeat stan and we want to make sure that you stay up to date with everything. So again, all the films um, are available. Um, either they will be airing this month if they haven't aired already on World Channel, please check, go to the World Channel website to check out the schedules or they are streaming like our film far east deep south which aired last week um, or this past week um, is now streaming available at worldchannel.org um, i hope you've had a wonderful time with us and please enjoy the rest of your afternoon evening wherever you are stay safe and healthy um, there are so many wonderful aapi stories that we hope you'll explore and such as the new season of pacific heartbeat on world channel and pbs and we're going to give you a sneak peek right now.